All right, so welcome. Uh, my name is Timothy Byers. I'm the director of cannabis programs at Pacific College and the president uh, of Radical Health. This lecture is uh, lecture three in a four part series. Uh, in the previous two lectures, we focused on cannabinoid science. Uh, in the last two, we're going to shift to cannabis related policy. And I'm hoping that the content uh, in these lectures will reinforce and support the material that all of you are getting in your Pacific College courses and also in your radical health packages and modules. So these are the last two lectures in the series. Uh, the final lecture is scheduled for early June. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how media coverage can influence public perception and then subsequently government policy. So uh, let's start here. Um, public support for cannabis legalization has dramatically increased uh, in the past two decades. In fact, a, a 2020 Gallup poll reported that 68% of Americans, so two out of every three Americans now support cannabis legalization. Um, of course, um, US public views about cannabis legalization have not always been so liberal. Uh, in his book, Marijuana, A Short History, John Hudak notes that support for cannabis in 1990, uh, and this was despite some fluctuations through the Nixon and Carter administrations, was nearly identical to support for cannabis in 1969. And that was the first year that Gallup polled respondents about cannabis legalization. So in 1969, 12% um, of Americans supported legalization and 84% opposed it. Uh, I believe in 1990, there was about 16% of people who uh, favored cannabis legalization. So they were very similar. Now, um, by the mid 1990s, public opinion slowly began to evolve on cannabis legalization. The Compassionate Use Act or Prop 215 in California, for example, uh, passed through an initiative process uh, in 1996. It, there were nearly 56% um, uh, of votes cast were cast in favor of legalizing cannabis in California. I don't want to suggest that there was any single factor that was solely responsible for changing public opinion. In fact, I think that likely there were multiple factors that helped move the needle. Uh, Hudak in his book suggests that generational replacement, so the gradual replacement of older generations in the voting public with younger generations in the voting public uh, likely had a profound effect on cannabis policy and public opinion. Uh, the influence of specific individuals, people like Robert Randall and Alice O'Leary Randall, Dennis Perone of the Cannabis Buyers Club, uh, Mary Jane Rathbun, other significant advocates in San Francisco during the AIDS crisis in the 1990s, 1980s and 1990s, certainly influenced public opinion, at least in the Bay Area. And um, there's Mama Alice right in front there. Uh, Martin Lee of Project CBD, he suggests that uh, during the emergence of the internet in the mid 1990s, cannabis related websites began to flourish and this enabled uh, the distribution of long suppressed information about cannabis culture and cannabis cultivation and cannabis use. Uh, activist groups like um, the Cannabis Action Network uh, were no longer required to travel across the country in a van handing out you know, paper leaflets to distribute their pro cannabis messages. And then of course the endocannabinoid system was discovered in the late 80s and early 90s. And this initiated an uh, interest in cannabinoids that would result in tens of thousands of studies published in the medical literature. <clears throat> and while it seems somewhat unlikely that the increase of recreational use had um, any significant impact on public opinion, maybe there was a small increase uh, in uh, recreational users and that might account for uh, rising approval numbers. Uh, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 10% of adults reported cannabis use in 2001. Uh, by 2015, the number of adults reporting cannabis use increased to 13.5%. So a small increase. So you know that might've contributed also uh, to the shift in public opinion. All of these factors likely helped influence public opinion on cannabis. Uh, I will suggest, however, that one of the most influential factors that moved the needle, especially outside of cannabis friendly cities like Ann Arbor and Berkeley and San Francisco, was the media focus on cannabis as a medicine. 
Uh, in fact, it's well accepted that historically, the media played a large role in shaping not only public attitudes towards cannabis, but also uh, they played a role in shifting US cannabis policy. So media narratives have the ability to transform and reinforce political discourse. Uh, narratives create frameworks that individual uh, influence individual thinking about a topic and influence how institutions develop policy. The manner in which media produces and reports on these social issues can influence the society's understanding of and also reaction to those issues. Uh, for those of you who have had uh, Alice O'Leary Randall in CAN 412 at Pacific College, or perhaps you've seen her speak at a public event, um, you've seen her present some history on cannabis and, and some, some images of the absurd media stories from the 30s and 40s. Um, of course, one of the most infamous being the 1936 propaganda film Reefer Madness. Many of you have heard of that or maybe even seen it. Reefer Madness was only one example of an entire genre of newspaper stories and pulp fiction and sensationalist films that, um, that were born out of the 1940s and 1950s. And these films and books and newspaper articles almost always included themes of licentiousness and anti-miscegenation and also just overt racism. And it's somewhat easy to, to laugh at these images now because of how, how absurd they seem, but this narrative definitely influenced public policy and legislation. In fact, in the, in the 40s and 50s, people were so terrified of cannabis that Congress passed the Boggs Act of 1951. This set mandatory sentences for drug convictions and a first offense conviction for cannabis possession carried a minimum sentence of two to 10 years in prison and a fine of up to $20,000. So $20,000 in today's value is about $200,000. And I'll suggest that this fear of cannabis, at least among some people in the political establishment, continues to linger to this day. Now, most people in the US and certainly pre-internet do not have direct knowledge about any illicit drug. They get their information from easily accessed sources, which is the mass media. Uh, the generation uh, born in the 1920s had very little direct knowledge and significant animosity uh, toward uh, drugs. Uh, and the media had an enormous impact on the opinion of this generation. And we know that the media is known for portraying worst case scenarios. We've all heard, if it, lead, if it bleeds, it leads. So the media places negative spin on events. They tend to exaggerate the issues. They tend to generate outrage so they can sell news. And mass media is a large and powerful myth maker. And these myths tend to fill gaps in our collective knowledge. They also influence our social reality. Uh, moreover, the, the phenomena is not only a relic of our distant past. Uh, during the war on drugs period of the U.S. history, which I might suggest continues to this day, uh, the U.S. witnessed a dramatic increase in the severity and scope of drug policies. Uh, the trend uh, of harsh drug laws in the 1980s and 1990s were not, however, a product of increasing crime rates. Uh, rather, these laws were more closely related to popular outrage generated by media representation. Just a side note, um, there are some who might argue that the war on drugs is a political strategy, not only garnered support from the general public, uh, but also facilitated the economic advancement of corporate entities. So advancing corporate goals provides significant financial and political benefits to politicians across the political spectrum uh, and exemplifies the uh, symbiotic relationship of corporate and political interests. So it should be no surprise that the harsh drug laws of the 80s and 90s uh, corresponded with the rapid expansion of the private prison industry. And it wasn't that long ago, it was certainly in my lifetime, 1980, when Ronald Reagan stated during a national speech that cannabis is, quote, probably the most dangerous drug in the United States, and we haven't begun to find out all of the ill effects but they are permanent ill effects, end quote. Now that assertion, of course, was then and remains now patently false. And Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign framed the discussion of drug use as a personal issue that can be resolved as easily as just saying no. 
Uh, and in addition to creating the perception that cannabis use was a major national issue, I mean, it was a, you know, it was a personal project of the first lady and the president of the United States was calling it the most dangerous drug in the US. This form of narrative suggests that all criminality, especially drug use, is an individual's moral failing with no consideration for social, economic, or political inequities. So what kinds of drug laws came out of the 1980s? Well, we had uh, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986. So this law increased penalties for drug crimes. It was the bill that created sentencing disparities between crack and powder cocaine. And of course, these two drugs are pharmacologically very similar. So this law established a mandatory minimum of five years for trafficking offenses involving five grams of crack cocaine. The same mandatory sentence, five years, was um, legislated for cocaine as well, but for 500 grams of powder cocaine. And because crack was more commonly used by poor Americans and by black Americans, this sentencing disparity helped fuel very large racial and economic disparities in incarceration. Uh, we also had the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988. So this law increased prison sentences for drug possession and enhanced uh, penalties for transporting drugs as well. Um, the act amended the 1986 act uh, to make crack cocaine the only drug with a mandatory minimum penalty for a first offense of simple possession. And uh, it restored the use of the death penalty by the federal government. Now, um, lest I leave you under the impression that these drug laws were largely uh, driven by Republicans only and during the Reagan administration, uh, it's important to note that the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 and 1988 were both sponsored and partly written by Joe Biden. Uh, furthermore, the Clinton administration didn't want to seem soft on crime or on drugs. And this was an accusation that was leveled at him by the GOP because, uh, you know, especially after that whole, I didn't inhale nonsense. Uh, so this administration, the Clinton administration, passed its own shameful legislation, the 1994 Crime Bill and the Three Strikes Law. So the 1994 Crime Bill authorized the use of the death penalty for an additional 60 new federal offenses. Um, and in uh, Michael Pollan's book, This Is Your Mind on Plants, great book, re highly recommended if you haven't read it. Um, he stated the following, he said, the Clinton administration was prosecuting the drug war with a behemoth never before seen in America. Uh, the year I planted my poppies, he's a, he's a gardener and a science writer, and he, he planted some illegal poppies in his yard just for the sake of experimentation. He said, the year that I planted my poppies in 1996, more than a million Americans were arrested for drug crimes. The penalties for many of these crimes had become draconian under Clinton's 1994 crime bill, which introduced the new three strike sentencing provisions and led to mandatory minimum sentences for many nonviolent drug offenses. By the mid 1990s, a series of Supreme Court decisions in drug cases had handed down the government a raft of new powers that have significantly eroded our civil liberties. The government also won new powers to confiscate property, houses, cars, land uh, involved in drug crimes, even when no individual had been convicted or even charged. End quote. So um, before we move on, I, I just want to point out uh, something on this slide. This is an article from the BBC, uh, and it refers to the consequences of the 1994 crime bill and the three strikes rule as a problem of overpopulated prisons. Again, it's important to note that some research indicates that mass incarceration rates that began in the latter part of the 20th century were closely related in, to shifts in the quantity and the tone of media crime reporting and not to actual increase in violent crime. Now, here's a caveat. If you do any research in this area, you will quickly discover that not everyone shares this view and certainly not people who are writing in the 80s and 90s and some people even to this day. So in the spirit of fairness, um, I'm gonna also present the prevailing perspective during the 1980s and 1990s. So this is a quote about the 1994 crime bill. It was taken out of a paper that's titled Overview and Reflections from the Council on Criminal Justice. This was actually written in 2019, so it's quite recent. Um, and it said this, 
The legislation was drafted and debated with a strong sense of urgency at a time of mounting national concern about violent crime. By the early 1990s, over half of Americans ranked crime as the country's most important problem. This concern was far from irrational. Violent crime rates peaked at 758 violent crimes per 100,000 population in the early 1990s, a level 27% higher than the previous peak in 1980 and 371% higher than in 1960. The violence and fear associated with the crack cocaine epidemic of the 1980s and early 1990s were lodged in the public consciousness and prominent criminologists were warning of an impending, quote, blood brat, a uh, bloodbath brought on by young super predators if something were not done soon, end quote. Uh, the article then quotes criminal justice policy uh, uh, analyst uh, Mark uh, Kleiman, and he stated this. He said, quote, the street level arms race financed by the crack trade had expanded the age range of killers and their victims down into adolescence. If you weren't seriously worried about crime in 1994, you just weren't paying attention, end quote. Now, you might forgive me if I dismiss Dr. Kleiman's hand-wringing despite his impressive sounding credentials. Um, uh, Mark Kleiman was a professor of public policy at New York University. Uh, he's an expert, or he was, uh, in the field of crime and drug policy. He wrote a bunch of books on drug abuse and drug policy, um, some of which actually question the conventional reasoning of national drug enforcement, especially the just say no approach of the Reagan era. But he also said some really dubious things too, like the D.A.R.E. program is a wonderful tool for police community relations, uh, particularly in poor neighborhoods. Uh, and he also said about cannabis, you just can't do the research in the U.S. because you can't get the pot. I keep saying that we don't know nearly as much about cannabis as Pillsbury knows about brownie mix. Now, Kleinman stated this in 2013, and he was partially right. In order to get cannabis for research, you had to get it from the University of Mississippi as a uh, you know, whole, uh, it's very difficult to, to acquire cannabis for research. But by the end of 2013, according to PubMed, there were about 25,000 studies published in the medical literature. We certainly knew a lot about cannabis in 2013. I also want to address this idea that there would be this impending bloodbath brought on by young super predators if something uh, were not done soon. Why was this idea of super predator lodged in the consciousness of the American public? Uh, a man named John J. DeLulio Jr. coined the term for a November 1995 cover story in the Weekly Standard. So at the time, the Weekly Standard was new. Uh, it included all of the conservative political opinion articles. Um, November 1995, the cover story was titled, The Coming of the Super Predators. And DeLulio warned that by the year 2000, an additional 30,000 young, quote, murderers, rapists, and muggers, end quote, would be sowing mayhem on the streets. He stated, quote, they place zero value on the lives of their victims whom they reflexively dehumanize as just so much worthless white trash, end quote. Now, DeLulio's quote, of course, assumes that white people are his audience and the potential victims of these crimes. And the quote subtext is that people of color are the super predators. And this type of language is part of another constructed historical narrative associating people of color with animal imagery. The consensus now, among historians is that the whole super predator theory, uh, besides being a racist trope, was not actually born out of crime statistics. So um, this NBC News article, which is on the, on the right of the slide, uh, quotes Tim, uh, Kim Taylor Thompson. She's a law professor at the New York University. And she said this, she said that the kind of animal imagery was already in the conversation. Um, and not only in the distant past, in 1989, uh, news media had used the terms wildling and wolf pack to describe five teenagers, four were black, one was Hispanic, uh, who were convicted and later exonerated of the rape of a woman in uh, New York Central Park. Some of you might remember uh, this case, uh, it's sometimes uh, referred to as the Central Park Five case. Uh, so Taylor Thompson had stated that the whole super predator language uh, began a process of allowing us to suspend our feelings of empathy 
towards young people of color, end quote. So we've taken this only slight super predator detour uh, because these are exactly the type of media articles that construct the narratives that facilitate the creation of and the justification for draconic, uh, draconian drug laws. Now, the following quote from the National Bureau of Economic Researchers, I think fairly summarizes uh, what I think is currently the prevailing consensus among research, uh, researchers and historians. And I, I'm gonna read this quote uh, because I think it informs the rest of our discussion today. Uh, so they said this, there's a widely held belief that the level of serious criminal activity increased during the 1980s, particularly among the urban underclass. Significant increases in both federal and state incarceration rates would seem to support this view. However, data from the Uniform Crime Reports, this is from the FBI, suggests only a mild increase in crime over this period, while the National Crime Survey actually depicts lower levels of criminal activity during this period. What we discover is that a large increase in the incarceration rate is attributable primarily to an increase in the likelihood of incarceration given arrest. During the latter part of the 1980s, a dramatic increase in the number of arrests and incarcerations for drug law violations also played an important role. So there wasn't necessarily an increase in violent crime. There was an increase in arrests and there was an increase in incarcerations subsequent to that arrest. And a lot of those arrests were for drug law violations. So let's get back to cannabis. We started the 1990s with only 12% of Americans believing that cannabis should be legal. How did we get to where we are today? Uh, in their uh, 2019 PBS article, reporters Amy Adamchek, Christopher Thomas, and Jacob Felsen uh, suggest that public opinion about cannabis began to change when the media began to write cannabis stories within the context of medical issues. So they noted that in the 1980s, uh, the majority of cannabis stories published in the New York Times focused on drug trafficking, on violent crime, and on drug abuse. Now, I spent all of five minutes in the New York Times archives and found these three examples. Uh, I encourage you to do the same. It's, it's uh, actually kind of an enlightening exercise. Um, furthermore, I think it's important to note that these articles are, uh, all three of them are written from the, expect from the perspective of the US being victimized by countries that are populated largely by black and brown people. That trend changed in the 1990s. So cannabis references combined with criminal activity uh, uh, began to gradually be replaced by stories describing medical uses, uh, uses of cannabis. So the PBS article stated that gradually the stereotypical persona of the marijuana user shifted from the stone slacker wanting to get high to the aging boomer seeking pain relief, end quote. So the seeds for this cultural shift were planted on Bob and Alice Randall's DC apartment patio in the mid, uh, in the mid to early, early to mid seventies and cultivated by their advocacy work through the 1980s. The shift also began to take place and take hold in San Francisco in the 1990s when uh, a compelling media narrative began to take shape and that was around HIV AIDS patients using cannabis to quell nausea and vomiting and uh, cachexia and to help mitigate the suffering of that disease. I don't have the data to back this up, but I do want to suggest that the HIV and AIDS narrative, as compelling as it was, was only compelling to a minority of Americans. I don't think it moved the cannabis needle in middle America. I think that the media narrative that was most compelling to the broadest base of Americans was the narrative that brought uh, the legal cannabis discussion from the fringes, from the coasts, and the fringes to middle America was the story of parents using cannabis to restore life to their sick children. So in 2011, 45% of Gallup respondents nationwide supported cannabis legalization. In 2013, 58% of Americans, and they were polled in early October, supported cannabis legalization. This is a pretty significant jump in a short amount of time. I don't think it's a coincidence that in August of 2013, uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta introduced America to Charlotte Figge. So uh, Charlotte Figge was a young girl in Colorado. She was diagnosed with Dravet syndrome. Um, by 2011, 
um, when Charlotte was five, she was having about uh, 300 uh, grand mal seizures a week. She had lost her ability to eat, to walk, and to talk. Um, doctors basically told her parents, take her home, make her as comfortable as possible, prepare for her passing. Uh, as a last resort, um, Charlotte's parents administer, administered her a CBD-rich extract through a feeding tube. Um, they, uh, they noticed that her seizures were immediately and dramatically reduced. And as word of this success began to spread, uh, CNN medical correspondent Sanjay Gupta was invited to the Figi home uh, to interview the family and possibly include, include Charlotte's story in his forthcoming documentary. So according to Paige Figgy, who was Charlotte's mom, um, during his visit, uh, an emotional Gupta found it very difficult to, recognize, uh, to reconcile uh, the child who was seizing in the old home videos with the playful six-year-old uh, with whom he was now visiting. So Charlotte was eventually featured on Gupta's cannabis documentary, A Weed, uh, and that aired in August in 2013. And it catapulted Charlotte's story and cannabis uh, to national prominence. So constructed cannabis narratives are as old as cannabis prohibition itself. Uh, the first constructed narrative that cannabis causes murderous insanity uh, was eventually replaced by a narrative that cannabis is part of a, a communist agenda to make our kids lazy and our nation weak. That narrative was eventually replaced by the narrative that cannabis is a drug with severe adverse medical effects. It causes a motivational syndrome. It kills your brain cells. It causes men to grow breasts. I'm not being ironic about any of these. These are all actually constructed cannabis narratives. Many of these narratives did not form organically. Uh, they were constructed deliberately um, and they are narrative strategies intended to mold and influence public opinion. Now in the modern era, there is no narrative as compelling as the cannabis helping sick children narrative. The, the powerful emotional resonance of watching or reading about desperate parents using cannabis to heal their sick children and also the emotional fulfillment of watching these children live more normal lives, I think has been instrumental in moving public opinion toward acceptance. So we've now seen a long history of cannabis and cannabis users being unfairly maligned in the media. Uh, and there's certainly been a shift in the type of cannabis uh, reporting. And this narrative shift uh, went from associating cannabis with gangs and violence and criminal activity to associating cannabis uh, with families caring for sick kids and seniors living better lives with cannabis. So um, the cannabis stigma perpetuated through the media is now dead. The stigma is dead, right? Yeah, well, not exactly. Um, these are a couple of, of examples of images that I pulled from uh, I think one is from the UK Daily Mail and the other is from the Business Insider. I grant you that neither of these are the New York Times, but it's still a reflection of how cannabis is sometimes still represented in the media. Um, these are images that were associated with stories about cannabis contributing to COVID-19. So on the left, uh, you have a very young person smoking a cannabis cigarette at the top, directly underneath a senior being carted away by first responders, presumably for COVID, because it was a COVID story. Uh, I assure you that the proximity and relationship of the images are intended to convey cause and effect. On the right-hand side, I can only assume that this is some supervillain in his lair, uh, dressed all in black and smoking a joint in his uh, full villain regalia. Uh, but clearly this is a continuation of cannabis scaremongering um, where the media can sometimes represent cannabis as a dangerous substance that, you know, used to lead to issues with addiction and mental problems and uh, inevitable abuse and uh, of other drugs and association with drug lords and violence. Uh, and apparently now uh, cannabis use inevitably leads to COVID-19 uh, as well. Um, often uh, these kinds of images are supported by dramatic sounding headlines. So uh, if you actually read the article also by dubious and unsupported claims. So for example, um, here's a headline. Uh, it was, um, what was this from? Was it CNN? Yeah, CNN Health. 
Um, most people won't read this article. They're only going to look at the headline. And if you do read this article, you'll see that the article makes the following claims, among others. Um, it claimed that cannabis can contribute to COVID because cannabis users might have confounding variables that confuse diagnosis. Doctors might think you have COVID when you simply have chronic cough. Of course, this doesn't support the claim that occasional cannabis use increases the risk of COVID or COVID-related complications. It also makes the claim that patients with COPD and lung disease and asthma are at high risk from severe COVID symptoms. That's true, but cannabis doesn't contribute to or cause COPD or lung disease or asthma. Again, this doesn't support the claim that occasional cannabis use increases the risk of COVID or COVID related complications. And another claim that it made was that cannabis causes impairment. So if you're at the hospital, you won't be cognizant enough to perform uh, to provide informed consent or be accurate uh, to provide accurate information about your condition. This is just simply nonsense and doesn't even really warrant serious consideration. Uh, here was another COVID-related article. Um, this was in the New York Times. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, nearly every vaping story that I see always conflates cannabis and tobacco smoking. We know the effects of cannabis and tobacco smoking and vaping are very, very different. Um, in this article, the US Surgeon General speculated that the prevalence of COVID-19 among young people might possibly be due to their predilection for vaping. Now, there is absolutely no evidence for this assertion. And in fact, uh, the FDA had to backtrack on its previous hardline position on vaping and the coronavirus. And they actually were forced to put out a statement in mid-April 2020 stating that um, there is no known evidence that, that vaping puts an individual at higher risk of developing complications tied to COVID-19. Also in this article, um, there's a quote from Dr. Jonathan Winnikoff, and uh, he was the director of pediatric research at the Tobacco Research and Treatment Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and uh, bless his heart, he said this, quitting vaping during this pandemic could not only save your life, but by, by preventing the need for your treatment in a hospital, you might also save someone else's life. Okay, fine. Uh, at the time during COVID, that, uh, there, there were a shortage of beds. But this is a very good example of conflating tobacco and cannabis, and also in the context of cannabis, a very good example of hyperbole. Um, this is another example. Early in August of 2020, the American Heart Association released a pretty comprehensive statement about cannabis and cardiovascular health. Uh, among other things, the report stated that, uh, quote, cannabis may have therapeutic benefits but few are cardiovascular in nature. Conversely, many of the concerning health implications of cannabis include cardiovascular diseases, although they may be mediated by mechanisms of delivery, end quote. Uh, the resulting internet headlines were breathless and alarming. Uh, Weed is not good for your heart, studies say. Millions of cannabis smokers at risk of deadly heart attack and stroke, docs warned. American Heart Association warns marijuana is a substantial health risk. Uh, and then my favorite, could marijuana break your heart? When you actually sift through the research, you'll find that it suggests that cannabis will likely not cause a heart attack in a healthy person and that cannabis smoking is estimated to account for a smaller proportion of heart attacks than air pollution. Even in geriatric patients, with existing severe cardiovascular disease, the risk of a heart attack when, when using cannabis is similar to uh, a brisk walk or to sexual intercourse, which is quite high, but we're talking about people who have severe cardiovascular disease. Now, clearly the risk of using cannabis, especially if you're smoking raw cannabis flour or ingesting very large doses, the risk is not zero. Cannabis is not entirely benign. Um, we know that there are adverse effects, especially when you're combusting cannabis, and especially in patients with existing cardiovascular conditions. But that said, I'm, I'm simply not convinced that the research warrants the excessive hand-wringing that we've witnessed in the media since the American Heart Association released their statement. Radical Health did an entire webinar on cannabis and cardiovascular disease. I invite you to watch it on the Radical Health YouTube channel.
All right, this is an article that caught my attention um, from March of 2021, so not, not that long ago. This article claims that vaping cannabis is worse than smoking tobacco or smoking cannabis flower. This is a shocking assertion, and it defies virtually everything that I know about cannabis and about tobacco and about vaping. Now, early in the article, the lead researcher is quoted as, as stating the following. He says this, without a doubt, cigarettes and e-cigarettes are unhealthy and not good for your lungs. However, vaping marijuana appears even worse. This is really disappointing because this was from a study from the University of Michigan, which is my alma mater. You have to read the entire article. In fact, you have to read all the way to the last paragraph to find out what's actually happening here. And you have to recognize what has been excluded altogether from the article. So this is the last paragraph in the article. The University of Michigan study included thousands of adolescents aged 12 to 17 who self-reported symptoms in the population assessment of tobacco and health study. One limitation of the report is that it didn't look at the co-use of vaping cannabis and cigarettes or e-cigarettes, the researchers stated. So like most vaping stories, they conflate tobacco and cannabis. First of all, we know tobacco is far worse and far more dangerous than cannabis. We can also assume that 12 to 17 year olds are getting their vaping products from the illicit market, given that uh, most states have age limitations on legal cannabis and most parents who are obtaining medical cannabis for their children are likely not using vaping as a route of administration. Uh, these respondents, these kids who are responding to the study, are likely using vaping products that are riddled with pesticides, uh, mold, and toxins, and uh, probably using products that contributed to the vaping-related lung injury crisis that we saw just prior to COVID. So, that's likely what this, what this study was looking at, looking at the effects of using illicit um, market products that contain things like vitamin E acetate and that was causing the E Valley outbreak uh, just, before, um, just before COVID. So really the article should be updated to state, vaping poison might be worse for your lungs than smoking tobacco studies show. Now, these articles are just reminders uh, to us that it remains important to read past the headline, whether, whether it's a mass media article, uh, uh, whether it's uh, a research study, it, it doesn't matter what the literature is. We wanna make sure that we can fully understand the content so that we can debunk nonsense uh, and clickbait and also negative propaganda when it appears. Now, we also want to follow the science. I mean, there, there are lots of studies that I read that are not cannabis favorable. That's okay. We want to follow the science, um, but read past the headline. Make sure that you fully understand what the content is and what the limitations are. All right, we're getting close to the end. Um, even when media coverage is neutral in tone or seemingly neutral in tone, the narrative framework can still influence public opinion and ultimate ultimately public policy. So I want to finish by looking uh, very briefly at a study that examined media narratives during campaigns to legalize cannabis in California and in Colorado. So these researchers did an analysis of 92 newspaper articles from um, one major newspaper in each market. So they looked at the Denver Post in Colorado and the LA Times in California, and they captured detailed descriptions of the various thematic narratives in each state. And here's what they found. So media coverage related to California's Proposition 19 focused on conflicts about legalization between social groups, as well as potential negative consequences for public safety. Prop 19 was rejected by California voters in November of 2010. Media coverage of the proposition in Colorado mainly focused on the political challenges of implementation and also on tensions with federal policies. So this proposition, Amendment 64, would ultimately pass in November of 2012. This was our adult use um, uh, uh, amendment that passed in Colorado that um, finally legalized adult use cannabis. So let's briefly take a look at each one and let's start with Colorado. So the, the most prominent theme that occurred in the articles published by the Denver Post 
uh, was called the political challenge narrative. Now, this theme occurred in 57% of the sampled articles uh, and involved descriptions of how a state model might be implemented and managed. These articles highlighted the necessity of extensive supervision and intervention that would be required in a potential a legal model. And these articles also provided descriptions of how a legal cannabis a model would transition into a commercialized product. So uh, media narratives that introduce legal cannabis as complex but manageable, uh, uh, and uh, that requires collaboration of multiple state institutions, they tend to produce this collectivist framework for conceptualizing legal cannabis models, and also they assume collective competence of state actors. So for example, um, this narrative reflected on well-defined plans for the execution of the amendment and focused on details and complexities of the actions to take. And there was also, um, there also existed an implicit assumption uh, in these articles that state actors would be able to execute uh, and, uh, the required tasks. So this narrative framed the debate as a unified collection of state institutions working collectively to solve a problem. The second uh, most prominent narrative that was detected in, uh, in the Denver Post was called the federal tensions narrative. So when articles discussed the political incongruence between state and federal institutions, they presented the legalization narrative as an issue affecting the state of Colorado as, as a collective unit. So they cited tension between state uh, and federal actors and they encouraged Coloradans to define themselves in opposition to the federal government, which strengthened the perceived alliance among Coloradans and created a perception of solidarity. So here are the conclusions from the researchers about Amendment 64, which again, passed in Colorado in 2012. They said, the themes present presented by Colorado media frame Amendment 64 in ways that ultimately strengthen collective state loyalties and perceptions of Colorado as a, as a unified body. The larger conclusions drawn from this analysis suggest that as marijuana narratives shift away from individualist, uh, individualistic orientations and towards descriptions of legalization as a social or collective issue with practical modes of implementation, new understandings are, are informed uh, and a different set of policy outcomes are plausible, end quote. So that was Colorado. Um, what kind of coverage was there in California for Prop 19? Well, the LA Times presented cannabis legalization using three uh, prominent narratives. And the researchers describe these narratives as the fractionalization narrative, the money narrative, and the irresponsibility narrative. So no wonder it didn't pass, right? Um, the, the fractionalization narrative was detected in 53% uh, of LA Times articles. So this narrative presents cannabis legalization as a divided and inconsistently supported model. These articles emphasize the uh, controversial nature of Prop 19 uh, by suggesting a lack of unified support uh, among demographic groups. So suggesting that they were highly divided positions in the young versus elderly voters, in progressives versus conservatives, in men versus women. Uh, furthermore, uh, these articles emphasize division even within uh, these demographic groups, such as within political parties and ethnic groups and communities. So descriptions about why different positions were held uh, were seldom addressed. They just said there are divisions. Now this form of legalization narrative emphasized divisions and disparities among demographic groups throughout the state, rather than describing the state as a unified entity, as we saw in the uh, California, or sorry, in the Colorado narratives. Uh, the second narrative um, that was prominent in California, 28% of all LA Times articles um, suggested that uh, legalization was a movement seeking extensive, extensive financial support. So this further kind of highlighted the existence of competitive elements. Um, these articles tended to describe the amount of money that was financing each side of the debate. And basically these articles were suggesting that legalization was a money grab. And then the final narrative prominent in California was the irresponsibility narrative. So articles that emphasize this narrative highlighted uh, the perceived recklessness and negligence of cannabis users. And this narrative appeared in about 25% of the articles. And these articles included concerns about things like drivers operating vehicles, 
or employees working under the influence of cannabis. Uh, for example, in one article in the LA Times, it stated that um, Prop 19 would, uh, if it passed, it would allow BART engineers, BART is our, um, is our uh, uh, city train system, um, it would allow BART engineers and school bus drivers to smoke marijuana right up until the time they climb up into the driver's seat. That's a quote of the article. So the narrative also included concerns that employers would have no ability to ensure that their employees would not be impaired uh, on the job and that injuries and lawsuits and increased insurance costs would inevitably follow. The irresponsibility narrative also draws on collective anxieties about society's most vulnerable victims, right? So in this case, it's fear for the safety of our children. We're gonna have stoned school bus drivers. And this also undermines support for uh, legalization policies. Last slide. So the researchers concluded this. They said, uh, the combination of the fractionalization and irresponsibility themes encourages individualistic, individualistic frameworks for understanding marijuana legalization that ultimately undermine the proposition. This mirrors traditional frameworks of drug crimes. In general, crime-related news stories provide detailed accounts of individual criminal elements with comparatively little attention paid to broader trends in crime. Few stories attempt to put cr the crime problem in a larger perspective, end quote. So the study states that the analysis supports the conclusion that media institutions hold considerable power on shaping perceptions about social and political issues uh, that will likely influence subsequent political action. So I wanna end with this. The manner in which we talk about cannabis matters. When you work in the cannabis industry, you become a cannabis advocate and you become a cannabis representative, whether you like it or not. People are gonna to look to you as subject matter experts um, and they're, they're gonna to, they're to stand toe to toe with you uh, and, and fight you on these issues. So the terms that we use um, can challenge entrenched mental constructs uh, or they can elicit stoner cliches, negative stereotypes and criminal tropes. Our words matter. Thank you for sticking around. My apologies again for the late start and for the confusion. Um, I'm happy to stick around for uh, 15 minutes. I do want to be respectful of, of the time, but I'm happy to take uh, if, if we have any questions or comments.